Open your Bibles again tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Let me, uh, for those of you that might not have been here and you're just kind of picking up on the middle of this so you'll have an idea of what what this series is uh, is all about. Naturally, it has to do with the subject of love from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to go all the way through the chapter. And uh, we... Uh, We've divided it up into different sections, and it's confusing because in the alliteration, uh, you know, the, each one of the sections starts with a word that begins with the letter P. And uh, I want to make sure I should have outlined it differently, and that way it, I think, would have been more clear. But the big sections through here, uh, let me just go over those so you'll understand. The first three verses... It talks about the prominence of love. The prominence of love. It is on display for us. The prominence of love. Well, beginning in verse 4 down through verse 7, this is the section we're in now, uh, he gives us a picture of love. Remember I said the Bible doesn't give you a definition of love, but it gives you a description. And we're looking at that description, and I've likened this section unto a picture album. And so as you think, as you're going through this album and you look at the different snapshots that make up the, the album, it began with uh, by talking about love's patience. Well, last week we talked about that. It suffereth long. Tonight... Uh, we're going to see love's practice, its kind, and uh, so forth. We'll go on, and there will be probably seven or eight messages on this until we get down to verse 8. Verse 8 opens up a new section that goes through verse number 12, and that has to do with the permanence of love. You see, love is not like one of the spiritual gifts that God installed for a certain period of time and then did away with. There is a permanence to love. It is just as important, just as necessary today as it was at any other time in history. And he's going to talk about the permanence of love in those verses. Well, we get to verse 13, and he talks about the preeminence of love. We started out talking about it being prominent, but then he's going to talk about the preeminence. It's not just prominent, it is preeminent. That is head and shoulders above everything else. And then we're going to get into a little bit into chapter number 14, and I'll let you know what that's about when we get there. But tonight we're going to look at part two, part two of a picture of love and consider it's practice. Look at verse number four again, where he says, Charity suffereth long. We've already talked about that, but tonight our attention is on these words. It says, and is kind. So this is the other side of the coin that we've been looking at. Patience endures insults and injury. Uh, but whenever we think about uh, kindness, that's something... Uh, totally different. Both of them are expressions of love, but love is long-suffering. It endures those insults and injuries. But when we talk about kindness, it's talking about something beyond enduring. It's talking about treating those, those offenders, those that hurt you, treating them as though they were friends. As I've said earlier, love is a choice that we make. It is a choice for us to seek the sacrificial good, the highest good of another person, even though they don't deserve it, because that's the way God treated us, and that's the way we are to respond to them. So tonight we're looking at the subject of kindness. Love is kind. And first of all, when we think about that, we need to define what we're talking about because certain words have lost their meaning over the years or lost their meaning by being redefined. I think, you know, if I ask for uh, examples of that, just about everybody would think of the word gay. 
you know, whenever I was growing up, uh, and, and the word gay, that meant, boy, you were happy, uh, joyous, and wasn't, that's a wonderful word. It's still a wonderful word today, but some folks have hijacked that word and taken it to apply to a lifestyle that is contrary to what the Word of God teaches. So because of this, it, it, it behooves us then to do our very best to explain what we mean when we use a word, even a word like kindness. We just assume that, well, we all know what that means. Well, the fact of the matter is maybe we don't. This particular word is, is a word that means good, it means gracious, it means uh, serviceable or being useful. And, and it's defined as showing oneself to be mild. Now, this is so important, and, and by by the way, this is I think if I, if I remember right, I think this particular word is used only maybe one other place in all of the Bible. This particular Greek word. Now, I mention that for a reason because this concept of loving people, uh, like Christians do, was totally foreign to the Gentiles. I mean, they thought we had a screw loose or something. Yeah, they, they, it was just like I was talking about in the last message. They did not look upon being long suffering as a virtue. They thought that was a weakness. They, they didn't think of that of being a sign of strength of one's character. They looked at it as a weakness. So whenever we think about being kind to others, that was basically not in their vocabulary. You know, that's not something that they practice. They were so impressed by the Christians that I'm, I'm told that they actually call Christians, and I, I can't even pronounce uh, uh, or don't know the particular Greek word, but whatever the, the Greek word that is here translated kind, that is the word that they use to describe a Christian. So, you know, you see somebody going down the street that's a Christian, everybody knows it because they're going to that assembly over there and so forth. So, oh, there goes one of those, uh, one of those, uh, people that show themselves mild. Somebody, you know, that, that, that is kind. They had that particular Greek word to identify them with. Now, needless to say, we don't usually make that kind of impression on people today, do we? I'm talking about Christians in general. We just don't. We're hated, we're despised, we're falsely accused and ridiculed in every, every way possible. And, uh, you know, the old excuse, well, there's just too many hypocrites in the church. You can't trust those Christian people and what have you. And uh, so we might think, well, we do pretty good, you know, at tolerating other people. But when it gets down to being known by our kindness toward those that have literally abused us and misused us, that's something else altogether different. The world doesn't see that in us nearly as much as they should. We just some way, we seemingly didn't get the message. But Paul got the message. Paul said in Romans twelve fourteen, Bless them which persecute you. Now, it's only natural that we bless them that bless us, right? I mean, well, that's easy. Uh, they bless us, we bless them. And in fact, sometimes we bless people that can bless us back in order to get the advantage, and we use people like that. It's just real common to do that, you know. We hold some at arm's length, don't want anything to do with us. Why? Because they couldn't make any contribution to us. They couldn't help us anyway. They don't stroke our ego. They don't do anything to make us feel better about ourselves. So we just treat them like they've got the plague and keep them out there at arm's length. But here's somebody else, you know, and we can, some way or another, we can use them to our advantage. Some way they'll, you know, they'll do a favor for us or treat us kindly. We embrace them with open arms and we do special favors for them and so on and so forth and well it's not a very good track record but Paul said bless those that persecute you we well, said well wh what did he mean by that well he knew you was going to ask that question so he answered it a few verses later in verse 20 listen to what he says if thine enemy hunger feed him and if he thirsts Give him drink. 
In other words, he's letting us know that real love is measured in deeds, not in words or feelings. Now, words and feelings are important, by the way, but they're never, they're, they never take the place of deeds. I mean, where there's true love, there's going to be some deed, there's going to be some expression of it. And he's talking about our enemies, those that, you know, that, that have hurt us, those that want to use us. And he says, if they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them to drink. That's the opposite of what we normally want to do. Our old flesh and nature says, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not going to turn the other cheek. I mean, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. I'm going to get even with you. So whenever the Bible says love is kind, this is what it's talking about. It's talking about someone that is mild, somebody that that is gracious toward others who do not deserve it. They don't just tolerate that is put up with those people, but rather they do something that is good and helpful for those people. Now that we've defined it, it always helps, I think, to see a demonstration of it. You know, it's real easy to define a word. I carry a dictionary with me in my briefcase. I have a dictionary in both offices. I keep a dictionary handy because a lot of times we assume we know the meaning of a word when we really don't, and it helps to uh, to look it up. But sometimes just looking up the definition doesn't give us the, you know, the the clearest picture. Sometimes a demonstration is better. And we see several of those in the Bible, don't we? I always think about Moses. I think about Moses interceding on behalf of the children of Israel. You'll remember that he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, you know, if you're not going to bless them and so forth, just take my life. You know, you you got to be pretty serious whenever you say something like that, right? And and, and here here is a man that, that stuck with them, whenever all they did was to rebel against God and resent Him as uh, as their leader. And constantly they were bickering and fighting and murmuring and complaining. And, and if ever there was anybody justified in saying, you know what, you're, if you're not going to follow God, if you're not going to listen to me and at least give me some measure of respect as God's leader, then I'm out of here. Uh, you know, by the way, I had a lot of preacher friends that resigned for a whole lot less than that. I mean, you would be amazed if you knew some of the things that has caused pastors to resign. Somebody said something about them, told a lie about them or somebody, you know, they didn't get their way in a business meeting or whatever. And so they they just resigned. And the sad thing about it is, they generally blame God for it. They, you know, stand up the next week before the congregation and say, well, dear brethren, I prayed about this a lot and I, you know, I've just come to the conclusion that it's God's will for me to leave here and look for another church. Well, God probably didn't have anything in the world to do with it, but they're resigning because they didn't get their way. Now look, love is demonstrated Whenever we come up against those that will not cooperate with us, do not appreciate us, will not help us, do not deserve our tolerance or our help, and we go above and beyond the call of duty and respond by helping them with their needs. That's what Moses did. But Moses wasn't the only one. I, uh, You know, I can't leave Joseph out. I think about what he went through and... My, you, you just imagine being in that position. You know, it's one thing for to have somebody that, uh, a neighbor or a co-worker that doesn't like you. You know, if you're a Christian, you've probably got some co-worker or neighbor that really, they don't even want to be around you. They don't like you. They don't like what you stand for. But you know, I can live with that. But boy, I'm telling you, whenever it's a family member, that's a whole different ball game that's when it really hurts because it's somebody that you love dearly somebody that ought to love you and uh, and and you want their love naturally and and all of a sudden they do something that is is painful they sold joseph into slavery and here is poor old joseph after that 
Because all of this is like a chain reaction. He's sold into slavery. Now he's falsely accused. Now he's in prison. Here he is. Everything is against him. Well, except God. God was for him. And God, contrary to all of the odds, God brought him up out of that horrible condition and put him, you know... Right behind old Pharaoh as far as authority in the land. And he had the key to the storehouse. I mean, he was in charge of food distribution. And there had been this horrible drought. And people all around from the neighboring countries and whatever. They're, the people are starving to death. They don't have anywhere to go for food. And they hear that down in Egypt, that they've got plenty of food. They've been storing it up now for these seven years. And they've got all of this food and so forth. And go down there. So the brothers go down there. And lo and behold. Now remember, remember at that point they have no idea the guy they're dealing with, the guy with the keys to the storehouse, have no idea that's their brother. They don't know what's happened to him by now. They, you know, he, they, they figure he's probably dead and they really don't care. They got one rid of him. They got rid of him. And the amazing thing is, even when Joseph discovers, these are my brothers. These are the people that sold me into slavery. These are the people that lied to my daddy and told him that I was dead in all of these years. He's been living with that pain of thinking I'm dead. I've been separated, deprived from the fellowship of my family. Man, if there was ever a time to get even, it's now. You made your bed, you sleep in it. No, I don't have any food for you. Tell daddy if he's hungry, he can come down here, I'll feed him, but I'm not going to feed you. But what did he do? Well, he he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I love that part when the boys go back home. And of course, you know, they're going to tell daddy, you know, hey, we found Joseph alive. How would you like to be in their shoes and try to explain that? So you go back there, and I love that point. It says that when he saw the wagons... He saw those wagons all laid it down with goods, with that food that was necessary to sustain their life. Food that Joseph had provided. That's kindness. That's what we're talking about. They don't deserve anything, and he gives them the very best of the land. I think about another example is the Good Samaritan. We talked about him a few weeks ago. And here's the Good Samaritan, you know, and uh, finds this fellow wounded and half dead. I, I used to preach, you know, you couldn't be half dead. You're either dead or alive. But I was wrong because the Bible says you can be half dead. This guy was right near death's door. He didn't have anyone to help him. The priest wouldn't help him. The Levite wouldn't help him. All of those, in other words, that you would think would render aid, those religious people didn't have any time for him. But here is a good Samaritan. Remember, the, the Samaritan was a half-breed, and nobody wanted anything to do with them. I mean, the Jews, they didn't want anything to do with him. But when he sees this man, he goes to him, gets down off of his animal, he goes to the man, he pours in oil and wine, he ministers to the man, and then he takes him to an inn and, and, and makes provisions to take care of him. And he says, you know, whenever I come back, you know, if the bills run up any higher than that, he said, I'll, I'll take care of that then. The amazing thing about it is he responds to the needs of this man when he did not see any way or did not inquire as to how this could be used to his advantage. You know, he could have said, he could have said, now look, look, fellow, I'm willing to help you, but, you know, if you can pay me back with just small interest, I'll keep it down there, you know, where it's, uh, not not too bad, but but if you if you can pay me back, I'll help you. Uh, or if you'll go tell everybody else what a great thing I've done, you know, and if I can get some publicity out of it, I'll be glad to help you. You know, if it'll you know if it'll in some way help other people, you know, if it'll stroke my ego, if it'll make me feel better and so forth about myself. He he didn't ask any of those questions. He he wasn't looking for any. Any praise, he wasn't looking for any gain, any profit, or anything whatsoever. He just saw a man in need, and he didn't care. He didn't say, look, buddy, you know, if you're a Baptist, we'll help you, or whatever. He just said, here's a man in need, and I'm going to help this fellow. 
For many years, I suppose over 40 years now, in every Bible that I've used, I have a, a quotation that I've, uh, that I've written down. It was written by a fellow by the name of Stephen Grillett, who was an American Quaker back in the 18th century. And uh, it says, I shall pass through this world but once. Any good thing, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness that I can show any human being, let me do it now. Let me not to defer nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were all that thoughtful? Really, think about it. If we lived every day of our life looking for those opportunities to show kindness to someone else, and we have one opportunity after another, the problem is so many times we not only refuse to respond to the opportunity related to other people that we meet out there in the everyday ordinary things of life, we don't even respond to the needs of our own family and stuff. How horrible is that to think about, you know, that that we do not respond with kindness toward the needs of those that are our own flesh and blood. The Good Samaritan set a good example for all of us. But here's what I want you to notice. Now, I've tried to define it. I've tried to demonstrate it. And we could go on and on and on with that. But but the thing we've got to remember is that it's demanded. Kindness is demanded. It's not something that you can take or leave. And from everything that we've talked about so far, you know, I think if we're really honest, most of us have to admit, you know, I've I've not scored a very high grade in this regards. I've not I've not been as kind to people as what I ought to be. And, and, and I think we'd be honest and say that we're lacking in love. I mean, maybe not all together, but surely we would all say, you know, I could do a lot better than what I'm doing. You know, but since we're commanded by the Lord to love others, to show them kindness, uh, that makes this a more serious matter altogether. Did you know God has a dress code? I sent out an article this last week, and I remember a certain comment. In fact, it's one of the ladies that's that's here that one of our members commented on appreciating that. It had to do with the Christian dress code. Turn to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3, verse 12. Here's, here's the dress code. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Wow, I don't even have to explain that. You just look at those qualities that he's talking about there, and they all spell love, just exactly what we're talking about. And he's telling us as Christians, we are to put on those things. The Bible tells us that we're to put off the old man. That is, we're to put off from us those things that that are associated with our past manner of life, those filthy, sinful things that, that are offensive to God and harmful to us. Put off those things and put on these things. You know, it's a shame that we get, I, I can remember, I, and I can take you to a church right now over in Kentucky where it's their practice. They, and by the way, there ought to be modesty in the church. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But their practice is that they keep some, I, I don't remember what they call them, their covers, little blanket things. And, and if girls, and I'm talking about you, even if you're not a member and you come in and the girls got on a real short skirt, they'll ask you to put that over your lap, please. 
You know, I believe we ought to be modest, but I think it's a whole lot more important that we show love to those people than it is for us to try to force modesty upon them. If you've got to enforce modesty, let me tell you, it means absolutely nothing. And all you do is offend those people. They'll never forget that. And let me tell you, They'll also never forget whenever they see you being loving and kind toward them. And this is exactly what he is demanding here in this dress code. That's our dress code right there. And that's what it takes for us to dress for success. You know, uh, the, the article the other day talked about this fellow that years ago had written the standard book on dressing for success. You know, that the world even recognizes that, you know, how you dress is, is important. How you present yourself is important and so forth. They understand that. Well, it's extremely important in the spiritual sense that we be properly dressed. Now, now listen carefully. Most of us, most of us, most of the time, I think that we have the strength to refrain from uh, retaliating against our enemies. And most of us do. Now, sometimes we might act out of character, you know, and say something that we shouldn't, trying to get back at somebody. And in an extreme case, we might even threaten to punch somebody in the nose, you know, but, uh, we, but, but that's out of character. We don't normally do that. So we do pretty good at that most of the time. And there are some of you that have the strength to actually do good to your enemies. Well, most of the time, right? But let me tell you, there are none of us that have the ability to do both of those things all of the time as we should without the enablement of God's Spirit. You know, listen carefully. I do not want to leave the impression that loving others is hard. I I want to leave the impression or make the impression that it is impossible. In and of yourself, on your own, it is absolutely impossible for any of us to love other people as we should. It really is, folks. Because even though we might do the right thing, oh yeah, man, the Bible says I'm supposed to I'm supposed to help help this guy, and you know he's hungry, so I'm I'm going to feed him. But we might do that, but you know, but not with the right attitude of the heart. So so that's a failure right there. We're to do what we do out of a spirit of love, and without God's help, it's absolutely impossible because only the Spirit of God can enable the child of God to do the will of God. He's the change agent. He's the one that enables us. Without His help, without His strength, we are sure to fail. That means, when we think about this matter of loving others, being kind to others, why we generally excuse our failure by saying something to the effect, well, yeah, but I mean, they're a tough case, you know. Uh, you know, I usually don't have any problem loving people, but they did something so rotten, so low down, so offensive. In some way or another, we're always looking for an out. And, and what we really mean is to, you know, that I will love you if you will meet my expectations. I'll love you. We're talking about conditional love. I'll love you conditioned Upon this, you cooperate with me, you show love back to me, you return the favor or whatever. And that's not, that's not love at all, but that's the level that most people supposedly love one another on. So in order to fulfill the law of love, for us to love others unconditionally, when there's nothing in it for us, to love others when they do not deserve anything, that's loving others like Christ loved us. And that's what makes all the difference in the world. So let me wrap all of this up and I'll just give you a sort of a summary and 
starting where we are with this being something that is demanded, the first thing I want to emphasize, this is commanded. We are commanded to love one another. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 is very clear about that. He is commanding us to love each other. And he says, notice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's a command. It is a command by God. That makes it important, right? It's a command that is by God. It is a command to all. That is to all of those of us that are Christians. So, so this is not a command. This is not an obligation just for a select few. Now, this morning after the service, we had some pictures for something. I, I the directory or, or something anyway is taking pictures and had a picture of the deacons and a picture of the trustees and brother Kenneth and I and there with them. Uh, th- that that picture didn't include everybody. We you know we, we didn't say okay everybody come up here and get your picture made. No. Uh, it was just for those that were deacons or for those that were trustees and separate pictures there. And uh, so it wasn't for everybody. But whenever we think about the command to love one another, that's an obligation not just imposed upon those gentlemen, that's something imposed upon every single one of us. So it is a command by God to all, for all. Remember what Jesus said, love your enemies? Didn't He say that? We're to love our enemies. And even the Bible also emphasizes we're to love strangers. The stranger is someone you you don't know and, and implies someone that can't pay you back, do anything good for you. So, so this, this, this command to love other people involves all of those that we have interaction with, that we are to be kind to them. So it's commanded. Secondly, it's Christ-like. You know, I've, uh, I suppose every every preacher at some point has thought, you know, man, I wish I could preach like the Apostle Paul. Wouldn't that be great? Be able to preach like Paul? You know? Well, you, listen, you don't have to preach like Paul. You don't have to sing like Brother Barry. You, you know, you don't have to do, you don't have to give large sums of money. You don't have to work miracles even. You don't have to do any of those things to be like Jesus. But you gotta be kind. You gotta be kind. There's no, no getting around that, folks. Because if we're not kind, we're not Christ-like. Not only that, this is crucial. And by that, I mean that Whenever we think about ministering to others effectively, when we think about carrying out the mission that God gave us, it is absolutely crucial because we are never more like God than when we're kind to those who do not deserve it. That's in that what he said there in Ephesians four. We're to be kind to others. How? Like Christ was kind to us. So it's crucial that we do this. Now we can fail at a lot of things. It's not really that big of a deal, you know. We can set a Sunday school uh, uh, goal, for example. We can say, all right, we're, man, we're going to work and we're going to pray. We want to have 400 in Sunday school next week. You know, and if we don't reach that, oh, well, we can be disappointed. But that's not that big of a deal, folks, you know. But I'm telling you, when the Bible commands us to love and we fail there, Boy, we are flat on our face. That That's crucial. That is important. Not only that, but let me tell you just a couple more things. When we think about this kindness, this the expression of love that reaches out and helps those that do not deserve it, uh, it is capable of a great many things. It, it is able to accomplish what we could never do by by argument. You know, we get the Bible and open it up and say, look, I'm going to prove to you some big doctrinal issue. Uh, you know, for example, I believe that the church existed before the day of Pentecost. The Protestants say it started on the day of Pentecost. I, I don't believe that at all. You know, old-timey Baptist, none of the Baptists ever believed something like that. That was a Protestant idea. But look, we get up and argue about that all day long and not not really prove anything and nothing be accomplished. We we could talk about different things related to prophecy, for example. And whoever wins or whoever loses that argument, it's, it's not that big of a deal. 
But let me tell you, when it comes to this matter of love, our means of being able to reach others and uh, enable them to respond to our message, there's that's nothing that makes us capable like kindness, loving kindness toward them. And, and, and in doing that, it is a great comfort to them. Isn't it, isn't it great whenever you find, uh, maybe, maybe some of you, you know, you've been out of town or you've been in a, just moved to a, a new place or something and, and you find a, a church and a Christian family and boy, you're just, just accepted, boom, you're just part of it. And what a comfort that is to find people that are kind toward you. You get a new job. And you, you, you go on the job. You don't, you don't know anybody. All, all you have is a job description. And you know, you know your job description and you got some idea of what you're going to get paid, but you don't know anybody. You don't know what to expect. Isn't it wonderful whenever you find out that, hey, I'm working for, I'm working for Christian people here. I'm working for people that really care about people. I'm working about people that take care of their employees and what have you. What a comfort that is. And let me tell you, whenever throughout the normal workday week, as you interact with other people, showing kindness to others is kind of like a breath of fresh air to them. You, you, you think about a, a waitress, for example. Can you imagine working with the public and putting up with all of the nonsense those poor people have to put up with? Boy, they've got a tough job and, and they, they get all the, they're not even supposed to, they're not the ones that even cook the food, but if it's wrong, they're the ones that get an earful when everything goes wrong. And boy, can you imagine how, how comforting and encouraging it is to them when all of a sudden, you know, somebody, uh, somebody says something that, it, that shows kindness toward them or maybe gives them a little bigger tip than normal or something. And, and so, Love, real, true love, genuine love, the Bible says, is kind. But but where does it come from? How how is that kind of love created within us? Because you know we can sit here with our open Bible all day long and read all of these verses. Says you're to love the Lord thy God, and the second commandment is like unto the first. You know, and and read the, the here here the new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. And go all through the Bible and just read every single verse related to our responsibility to love others, and and still not love other people like we should. So how how can we make this happen in our life? Well, real, true, genuine kindness is the expression of our love that comes out of a grateful heart for the love that we've received from God. You 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 see if if you really appreciate what God has done for you, you know what you're going to do you're going to want to show that kind of kindness towards somebody else. You see, that, that's where it comes from. And it's never dependent upon them and their actions and their character. It, it, it's always on our shoulders. It depends on us and our relationship with God. And, and boy, you, you, it's so easy to try to excuse our responsibilities and, you know, they they just don't deserve my help. Well, no, but we didn't deserve God's help either. And think about what all He's done. Think about hey, listen, not just what He did. Think about what He's doing right now. I'm telling you, what not a week goes by, but what God wouldn't be justified in killing all of us if He just wanted to throw a hissy fit. But instead of doing that, He's long suffering. Amen. He's long suffering and he's what? And he's kind. He's kind. Let's be that kind of a person to somebody else. Let's stand together. Father, tonight we thank you for your loving kindness toward us and we, we just pray that you'll forgive us of the times, the many times and the many ways that we fail to demonstrate that sort of kindness toward others. And I pray, Lord, that you'll just help us, to, those that we are not able to win 
by our by our dogmatic doctrine, by our eloquent preaching, or by our argument, or anything else, help us to be able to win them by the overwhelming display of kindness that they see in us as your people. Teach us and help us, Lord, to love others like you loved us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Now we're going to sing a verse of invitation. And if you're here and God's speaking to your heart about anything whatsoever, it doesn't have to be related to this message, but if God's dealing with your heart about something, would you let Him have His way tonight? To you.